I'm Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute, and I am here today with John Lawrence, author of The Class of 74, Congress After Watergate, and The Roots of Partisanship. Welcome, John. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You worked in Congress for close to four decades. How did you get there? I had always been interested in politics. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, our family's closest friend uh, was elected to Congress, and that sort of sparked my interest. And when I was finishing a PhD at Berkeley, I volunteered to work in a campaign uh, for a person who was running in 1974. Uh, I thought it would be a short-term volunteer effort, but after the election, George Miller uh, from the Bay Area asked me if I wanted to go to Washington to work for him, and that sounded like a pretty good deal particularly compared to where the history job market was at the time, and that turned into almost 40 years in Capitol Hill. And how long did you work for Miller? I worked for Miller for 30 years in one capacity or another, so I was his chief of staff and legislative director, and then he became the chairman of the Resources Committee, and I had always done a lot of the legislative work around water policy, national parks. I became the staff director of that committee. Uh, and then in 2001, he became the ranking Democratic member on the Education and Labor Committee, Education and Workforce, uh, under the Republican uh, majority. And I became the staff director there. And then in 2005, uh, I was uh, traded over to then Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi as her chief of staff. So for those who uh, haven't worked on the Hill, what is the job of a chief of staff? Well, it's different in a personal office than it is in a committee, and it's different in the leadership than it is in uh, either of the other two. In a, in a personal office, you, you're wearing the hat of both a uh, person who's directing the office's activities uh, in Washington, and that includes legislative, press, administrative. You're generally the chief advisor to the, to the member, but you're also keeping a pretty close eye on what's going on back in the district and trying to coordinate the district activities, casework activities, political appearances with the official activity. In the committee, you're really less concerned with the uh, activities back in the district. Uh, you're working for the chairman or for the ranking member if you're in the minority, but you're also working for all the other people in your caucus on that committee and you're collaborating with the uh, staff and the members from the other side, so you're trying to produce a work product. Uh, in the leadership, uh, it's a very different situation when you're chief of staff to the speaker. You've got a much larger staff, and the staff has far more varied responsibilities with respect to, uh, in Mrs. Pelosi's case, uh, her legislative agenda, uh, the press uh, operations, but you also have advanced staffs and executive staffs, and of course, enormous amount of collaboration uh, with uh, the members of the caucus. The White House, the Senate, your chief liaison for those uh, for those uh, other branches, other parts of the Congress. So it's a much more varied uh, responsibility. Again, like the committee, however, largely dissociated from the members' own personal political uh, operation in the district. Why'd you stay for so many years, and what ultimately led to the decision to, to hang it up? Uh, I stayed because I think unlike many people in, who go to work in, in the Congress, I never got bored and I never got frustrated. Um, I was there long enough in the majority, uh, the first 20 years were in the majority, and I was fortunate enough to be working for a member who gave me an enormous amount of autonomy and who was willing to follow up on the legislative or other policy initiatives that I came up with. So I never really ran into that problem where that, that seems to afflict a lot of people on the Hill where they, they just are doing the same thing over and over again, or they've got somebody over them who's just not letting them uh, develop either professionally or with respect to the policy uh, interests that they're, uh, they'd like to pursue. I never had that. If I had a good idea, or what I thought was a good idea, and I could take it to Congressman Miller, uh, and I could document to him why it made sense to either begin an investigation or to write a piece of legislation, uh, he generally would say, fine, let's pursue it and let's see if it works. And, and often enough, it would end up finding its way into legislation. So I didn't really have that sense of frustration. Once we went into the minority, of course, it becomes a more frustrating operation. But we still, for much of the 1990s and even into the 2000s, when I was collaborating with John Boehner, who was the chairman of the uh, 
of the Education uh, and Workforce Committee, we still were able to cut enough deals. We hadn't gotten to the point of partisanship where it was almost impossible to legislate. So I think one of the reasons I stayed was, um, it, it, first of all, it's a lot of fun uh, to work on the Hill. It's a lot of fun to work in politics. But secondly, I, I really had a sense that um, if you were willing to put in the time and you know, work with the, all the different aspects of, of the House, the Senate, the majority, the minority, you could actually be, have an influence, change people's lives, improve the country. So, uh, you know, that's a hard act to follow when, when you're, you you're have a chance to operate in that sphere. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the subject of your book, which centers heavily on the, the 1970s, but also draws us up to the current time. In late 73, 93 new members, 76 Democrats and 17 Republicans were elected to the House. It was a landslide election. What factors brought about that huge influx of new members? Well, I think that there was there were a number of them. One was certainly the frustrations uh, emanating from Watergate. There was a large uh, amount of uh, dissatisfaction across the political spectrum with the Nixon administration, with the prolonged uh, the, the antagonisms and bitterness and divisiveness of the Watergate scandal that of course, it dragged out from 1972 until uh, 1974. And then, just as it was winding down in the beginning of, of August when President Nixon resigned, uh, a month later, President Ford pardons uh, President Nixon, and that sort of flares up a lot of uh, concern and a lot of, of, uh, of dissatisfaction again. So that was one piece of it. I think another piece was uh, certainly Vietnam, and that was a major factor in terms of motivating the people who ran in this class of 1974. Vietnam had been, at that point, our longest war, and again, extremely divisive, uh, and uh, had really sapped the country of a great deal of, of uh, unity, a great deal of optimism. Uh, people were looking for a change. People wanted a change of direction in, in the country. and then. Uh, there was a lot of uh, concern, I think, that Congress just wasn't doing its job, and partly that was because of the seniority system and the difficulty of, of legislating. There were some major efforts underway in, in response to what we think of as the imperial presidency, the gathering of power disproportionately in the hands of the executive, uh, which had been so much of a feature of the 50s and the 60s. Congress and 73 passes the War Powers Resolution and 76 passes, passes the Budget Act and begins to claw back some of that power, but still Congress was not really addressing a whole host of issues, whether it was energy or the environment or women's issues or special education, civil rights, that, that were festering and growing and, and were being reflected in a lot of popular movements. So there was, there was definitely a sense that there was change in the country, there was a desire for uh, new policies to be addressed, and yet the Congress uh, was sort of resembling what, what, uh, what uh, Senator Joe Clark in, 19, in the 1960s called the sapless branch of government. It just wasn't, it wasn't able to function. It needed an infusion of new blood, it needed an infusion of, of energy and optimism, and that's what this class really provided. And did the 65 Voting Rights Act also bring in a lot of new voters who who showed up to the poll for the first time, or was that not a factor? That well, actually, that's a huge factor. Both the Civil Rights uh, Bill of 64 and the, and the Voting Rights Act of 65, and then you, of course, had reapportionment that takes place in 71, 72, so now people are running in different districts, had a significant impact, particularly in the South. And I devote a lot of my uh, attention in the book to the changing South. Uh, one, of the, one of the most significant developments in, in post-war American politics is the revitalization of the Republican Party in the South. The Republican Party had been largely moribund uh, for most of the 20th century, and that meant that the Democratic Party had a lock on most of the seats, and since those people did not typically face competitive elections, they gained seniority. They, in, under the chairmanship system, they gained enormous disproportionate power, uh, and uh, that was because they were largely being elected by a smaller cohort of white conservative voters in the South. With the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, you have a large infusion of African Americans into what was still a largely Democratic-dominated uh, region. And you begin to see people uh, in 70, 72, and then in 74 
winning primaries uh, who are winning because they are able to enlist the black vote, uh, which is still small in some areas, but still becoming quite influential, and they're able to, to dislodge uh, those older established conservatives who had never been concerned about the black vote and had been strong segregationists. And so they win, they're white, they have strong black support, they're very progressive by the standards of traditional Southern Democrats, uh, and they still don't have to compete against Republicans because the Republican Party has not yet emerged to that point. Once the Republican Party revitalizes in the late 70s, those seats become much more competitive and many of those uh, Democratic liberals, if you will, uh, begin to lose their seats and, and, uh, and, and uh, the Democrats as a result lose not only that solid control of the South, but uh, the entire race for control of the Congress becomes more competitive and, and uh, ultimately uh, the shift of those seats in the South and in the suburban areas uh, of the South um, uh, and border states help the Republicans gain the majority in 1994. The, uh, the 93 newcomers, they were a little different from the members of Congress who are currently in the chamber. How so? At the time, they were, uh, they were looked upon as being very rambunctious, very disrespectful. People both on the Democratic and the Republican side, so these people had never, Tip O'Neill famously said they never served in office, they never licked envelopes or walked precincts. Uh, even some of them agreed they were unusual. Toby Moffat, who was a freshman member from Connecticut, said, uh, we had long hair, we looked weird, I can't even believe we got elected. But in fact, uh, one of the reasons I wrote this book was to look a little more deeply into who these, these folks really were. And what emerges is something of a different, uh, a different picture. Uh, contrary to what O'Neill said, about half of the members of this class actually had served in elective office. They were state legislators. Uh, there was a lieutenant governor, there were numerous mayors, but there were also people who had been engaged in non-elective political activity uh, in the anti-war movement, in the civil rights movement, in the consumer movement, and they knew politics in the sense of they knew how to deal with the press, they knew how to build coalitions, and they knew how to build grassroots operations. And so they were not quite the neophytes that uh, often they were portrayed as being. They were dissatisfied with the pace of the institution, and that's one of the reasons why they were so receptive to efforts to dislodge some of the chairmen who were blocking this legislation from, from being considered. But I argue in the book they were not disrespectful of the, of the institution itself. In fact, being for the most part liberal Democrats, they very much needed a credible, functional Congress and federal government to carry out the policy objectives that they sought. Shortly after the class of 74 arrived, they uh, began crossing swords with powerful committee chairmen and longstanding members. Uh, one incident, and you recount many in your book, uh, happened early and involved an effort to open appropriations committee meetings to the press and the public, and it featured Representative John Rooney, an old New York Democrat uh, who had served for 27 years at that time, and the recently arrived David Obie, Democrat from Wisconsin. What happened? Well, you know, again, I think most people, uh, other than the small universe of, of congressional historians, don't remember how close this institution was. In the late 1960s, when Dave Obie arrives, uh, committee meetings were closed, uh, the press wasn't allowed, many committees did not produce reports to accompany their legislation, so people who were voting on legislation had no idea what they were voting on, they were completely dependent upon a very small select group of members and staff who controlled that process. Uh, most uh, debate in Congress was not covered by the press. There was no press going into these uh, committee hearings, subcommittee hearings, or even the floor. Uh, there weren't even recorded votes in, uh, on, uh, in most of the floor activity, because most of the floor activity took place in uh, the committee of the whole house, which is a technical construct, but basically meant that you didn't know how your member of Congress was voting. And as these reformers, and they really began their efforts uh, in the late 1950s, uh, looked at what was wrong with Congress, one of, them was, one of the problems they found was a lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, and they wanted to open this process up. They wanted to be, uh, allow the press, allow the public to come in, see the deliberations, and 
and, uh, and, and participate and then hold people accountable. So in this particular case, uh, in the Appropriations Committee, that was a famous a committee that was famously bipartisan because everybody just sort of whacked up the money uh, among themselves and everybody got taken care of. Uh, and uh, nobody quite on the larger universe of Congress knew exactly how those deals had been cut. Uh, and so uh, one of the uh, older members uh, became quite angry at Dave Opie, who was a veteran of the state legislature who had, that had been a more transparent operation in, in Wisconsin. And uh, he was, uh, they, they had a, a, a pretty uh, frank confrontation um, which ended with uh, Obi, who had only been there a very brief time, telling uh, Rooney to sit down and uh, you know uh, and uh, use some unpleasant language, uh, which uh, Rooney responded to ultimately by laughing and 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 uh, I'm not sure he thought it was that funny because uh, it really signified as as do some of the other encounters between the old generation and the new that um, there was there was a willingness on the part of these newer people to to challenge the status quo and chat, challenge the prerogatives of these uh, of these chairs who had for the most part never been challenged I mean you just you didn't do that um, you know Sam Rayburn fi famously said you know if you want to be effective around here just you know sort of be quiet don't don't rock the boat uh, and uh, you know eventually you'll accumulate influence these younger members uh, weren't interested in pursuing that kind of of advice, one of the reasons being, they said uh, to me when I interviewed them, many of them thought they weren't going to be around very long. They thought that they had won in this sort of anomalous election, and uh, they would be there for a couple of terms. And if they just waited, as Sam Rayburn had suggested, to gain the wisdom of the years, uh, they'd be gone by the time they they were able to uh, to gain that kind of seniority. So they were impatient. There's no question about that. And sometimes they weren't particularly. Uh, they weren't particularly polite about how they expressed that frustration. Yes, Rooney, Rooney called Obi a young punk, and Obi uh, responded by calling him a, an old goat, uh, if I recall yeah, correctly. Sometimes the language got a little hard, heavier than that, too. But, uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of the committee chairmen, some of them, uh, looking at them retrospectively, uh, pretty outrageous figures. They were many autocrats within the chamber. Who were John McMillan of South Carolina, F. Edward Hebert of Louisiana? Yeah, so McMillan was one of these very long-standing chairmen, uh, and he uh, was, a, as were a number of these old Southerners, they were uh, products of the segregated South, they were segregationists, and he had risen to become the chairman of the District of Columbia Committee, which in effect made him the mayor uh, of, of the District of Columbia. He, he controlled the government of the District of Columbia, and he certainly wasn't used to the residents of the city, uh, which did not have self-government at that time, uh, telling him how the city should be run. Um, so much so that uh, when the appointed mayor, not the elected mayor, but the appointed mayor, uh, which itself was a new position, uh, Walter Washington had the temerity to send a budget up to McMillan and say, this is how we think uh, the city should be run. McMillan responded by sending a truckload of watermelons to uh, to McMillan's house. McMillan, incidentally, was one of those people who had largely ignored the black vote because he didn't have to worry. There were only about three percent of the voters in his district who were able, uh, black voters who were able to vote. But by the early 1970s, uh, those that had swelled to maybe 30 percent of his of his electorate, and uh, he was he was defeated. Uh, in 1972 by John Genret, uh, who lost the general election. Enough of McMillan's people went over to vote for the Republican uh, to, to cross Genret the election. Genret comes back in 74, wins, and uh, with the black vote and is able to become a member of the class of, of, uh, of 1974. Who was that? I'm sorry. Louisiana. Oh, Hebert. Edward Hebert. Well, Hebert was, a, again, a, a, uh, one of the crusty old uh, Southerners, Louisiana. Uh, Hebert uh, was uh, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, obviously, this is the time of the Vietnam War. He did not broach any dissent on the committee uh, uh, concerning the prosecution of the war, very strong supporter of the war. Uh, and in 1973, 
uh, for example, uh, a freshman uh, member uh, of, the, of the House, Patricia Schroeder, who was a Harvard lawyer but also had a pilot's license, was very interested in military policy, and Ron Dellums, who was a second-term African-American radical from Berkeley, California, both very strongly anti-war, uh, announced that they would like to be on the Armed Services Committee. Well, Abair was not amused uh, at the prospect of having a woman or a black member of the committee. There had never been either. And uh, Dellum said, well, you know, uh, about 30 or 40 percent of the people dying in Vietnam are black. Don't you think it's time that somebody uh, uh, be on the committee who was themselves black and maybe sensitive to, to those issues? Uh, Hebert didn't see it that way, but there were enough machinations, which I won't bore you with, that went on that they both ended up being on the committee. Uh, and uh, when the time came to organize the committee for the first day in January of 1973, uh, Hebert distributed the chairs on the dais to all the members, came then at the very end to the newest members, Patricia Schroeder and Ron Delms, and told them, you have to share a chair because I don't consider you to be full members of this committee. I mean, that, you know, for a chairman to talk that way, you could get away with it in 1973. You couldn't get away with it in 1974 when this new class arrives and when that new class summons all of the chairmen. Uh, to address them and tell them why they thought they should be able to be the chairman, which had never happened before. Was, they'd only recently, the caucus had even given the caucus a vote on whether or not they would ratify the chairman who were selected by seniority. Uh, Hebert was the one who came into the room, put his hands on the desk and said, well, boys and girls, let me tell you how this place works. Uh, and uh, he was one of the three chairmen who was removed from, from the chairmanship by a vote of the caucus. Wayne Hayes also makes an appearance <laughs> yes. from Ohio, re remarkably powerful representative yes. at the time. What were the sources for his power? He had two sources of power. Uh, one, he was the chairman of the House Administration Committee. So that committee uh, wasn't a major policy committee, but it controlled everything from your assignment of offices uh, to uh, parking to uh, all those sorts of uh, your budget, your staff, so things that are really vital to just the, the, the daily lives of members of Congress. He was also the chairman of the campaign committee. So if you ran afoul of uh, Wayne Hayes, and it was fairly easy to do because he was a very, very gruff, confrontational, arrogant uh, person. Again, in the book, uh, several members use a slightly stronger language to describe Wayne Hayes. You could find yourself uh, in an office that was very, very remote, uh, in a parking spot which was impossible to find, and virtually impossible to raise money for your reelection campaign. So he, he had this double leverage of both money and institutional power, which he uh, used to, to uh, secure loyalty to him and, and to his continued chairmanship. And even though the Steering and Policy Committee, the Leadership Committee, uh, in 1974 recommended that he be removed from office as one of these uh, chairmen, uh, the members of the caucus, including many of the members of the class of 74, voted to keep him in place because he was able to provide so many services and supports to their office. So for those who are not close Congress watchers, could you explain briefly how does the House of Representatives change its rules and highlight some of the big changes the class of 74 and the existing reformers made. So the House, unlike the Senate, adopts a new set of rules every two years. So the Senate is a continuing body because it only elects one-third of its membership every two years. So there isn't a formal vote on the Senate rules, but there is in the House. The House rules technically could be completely rewritten uh, at any time. And uh, generally they're not uh, they're not completely thrown out and start, and start over again, although they can do things like create or, or uh, eliminate committees. Uh, but they also just establish the parameters for the operations of Congress and the rules are going to be for the consideration of legislation. And uh, that is generally prepared by the speaker. It is a majority document, uh, so who controls the Congress is very decisive in terms of uh, what those roles are going to be, rules are going to be, and um, 
then uh, it's voted on, usually it's not voted on the first day of the, of the new Congress. So uh, in this particular case, for example, there were changes to the rules that, that were made that made it easier to offer amendments, that changed the subcommittee selection process. Uh, that uh, gave greater power to the steering and policy committee that uh, took power away from ways and means, for example, to appoint members and instead gave to committees instead gave that power back to the leadership. And this was sort of a general move by the reformers, the class of 74 and then also others who were uh, strong reformers in the Congress, but had not been able to effectuate these changes until what Bella Abzug calls the reinforcements arrived. Uh, to uh, move power away from the chairs who held their power by virtue of seniority, uh, although with the approval now of, of, the, uh, of the membership, and give it back to the leadership which was selected and voted on and therefore had to be more responsive to the members themselves. And that was important in changing the, the nature of the policy produced because so many of those chairs were older, southern, more conservative than your average Democrat was come mid-70s. Absolutely, and it's important to remember, although everybody seems to know that three of the chairmen were removed in uh, 1974, uh, what's not commonly known is that another uh, half dozen or more uh, either retired or quit uh, or uh, uh, stepped down because of scandal uh, between then and the next election. So by the time you get to 1976, uh, just two years later, over half of the chairmen are new. And the ones who are remaining go through some pretty dramatic changes. Uh, so they now realize that their ability to chair the committee is dependent upon their ability to satisfy the caucus that they're running the committee in a fair manner, uh, in a manner that's representative of the, of the caucus. And some of these chairs who had been voting as much as 75 and 80 percent of the time with the re Republican minority uh, within uh, only a few years are now voting uh, overwhelmingly uh, in, in concert with the Democratic majority because they realize they owe their jobs to, uh, to the caucus rather than simply being able to depend on the seniority system. The class of 74 didn't just try to change the way the House operated, it also took on major issues of the day. You've already mentioned Vietnam. What were some of the other big issues of the day that they took on and moved the needle on policy-wise? Well, certainly one of the issues that they were most concerned about was energy policy. Remember, we were coming out of the energy embargo uh, the first time that the, that the OPEC countries had been able to constrain uh, the supply of energy, and it really raised the need for both domestic production of energy, uh, for greater energy efficiency, greater conservation, uh, greater R&D uh, into energy policy. And while that was broadly viewed as a, as a high priority for the, uh, for the uh, Congress uh, and for the Democrats, it is the, it's illustrative of the way in which some of these policy questions divided the members of the class as well as the members of the Democratic caucus far more than uh, the issue of reform itself. Once you moved into the area of energy policy, you had uh, the people who favored conservation, the people who f favored alternative, developing alternatives, but you also had people from the oil patch, people like Bob Kruger from Texas. You had people from uh, the uh, industrial north uh, Midwest who uh, viewed uh, requirements for more efficient cars or more efficient power plants as being very damaging to their local economy. So it became uh, uh, an intra-party uh, problem. In fact, you still had significant numbers of Republicans uh, who were supportive of environmental uh, and energy reforms uh, who could offset some, but not all, of that Democratic uh, resistance. So that was certainly one of the most important policies. Mm -hmm. They ended up passing a bill in, in 1975 which uh, was not as sweeping as they would have liked, but at least began the, the, the movement towards stressing conservation and mileage standards and, that, and efficiency. Uh, but there was generally dissatisfaction they weren't able to do more. Mm -hmm. So how did the changes in the House affect its interactions with the Senate and also the presidency? What did President Ford and then later Jimmy Carter uh, make of this new look House of Representatives? Ford was initially 
pretty appalled. Uh, his first encounter with, uh, with this new class is in April 1975. He comes up to Capitol Hill and he requests that they appropriate several hundred million dollars as sort of the last tranche of money for the Vietnam War. Two people, uh, my former boss George Miller and Toby Moffat from Connecticut, literally stood up and walked out of the chamber during the president's speech. And in his uh, memoirs, President Ford recalls that as being the most appalling behavior he had ever seen on the floor of the House, uh, just something you didn't do uh, to the president. Uh, I think the more substantive challenge that came between particularly the White House and, and the, the House uh, had to do with President Ford's prodigious use of vetoes. Um, and uh, both members of the Congress, uh, members of the press, uh, certainly the general public, did not fully appreciate how Congress could pass progressive legislation, whether it was uh, on labor and, and, and several other matters where President Ford would, would use his veto. Um, and, but they, while they had the, the sufficient votes, 218 or, or uh, 51 in the Senate, to pass the legislation, they didn't have the votes to overcome a veto. And so the press, for example, became highly critical uh, of the class of 74 in particular for not being more effective in passing legislation as opposed to simply implementing internal reforms. Uh, I think pretty unfairly, because even if you had everybody in the class of 74, and they typically did have almost everybody in the class of 74 voting t for veto overrides, you still had a sufficient remainder of what was called the conservative coalition, this group of very conservative Democrats and the preponderance of Republicans who were able to uh, block veto overrides. And, and as a result, there was a great deal of, of tension between the, uh, between the, uh, the Congress uh, and, the, and the presidency for the remainder of the, of the, of the Ford presidency. Uh, when the uh, administration changes in 1976, 1977, and President Carter comes in, the initial feeling is, well, this is going to be terrific now because uh, we have a president who's going to sign these bills. We don't have to worry about the veto overrides anymore. We don't have to gin up the two-thirds votes. We're just going to have, be able to pass these with the majority vote. And of course, Carter, uh, who had talked a great deal on the campaign trail about restraining spending and, and uh, paying much more attention to the deficit, uh, is not as supportive of many of these pieces of legislation as, uh, as the more liberal uh, wing of the party had been. And, and you begin to see that tension begin to build very dramatically, uh, certainly uh, in, by 1978, eventually culminating in the Kennedy challenge to Carter in 1980. So the book focuses on the class of 74, but it has another thesis inside of it, which involves uh, the changes that they made to the chamber to some degree released uh, partisanship, mm -hmm. or even fermented it to a degree. How'd that happen? You know, the word that I, I use is that it enabled uh, partisanship to emerge. I don't argue in the book that reform in and of itself caused a more partisan environment to emerge. I think there's a fairly healthy literature um, that I hopefully add to in this book that describes the changes that are occurring uh, in part because of this uh, changing of the, of the South and becoming a two-party system where the Democrats can no longer rely on over two-thirds of the votes to give them that automatic majority. You know, the Democrats controlled the House for 58 out of 62 years between 1932 and 1994. So that's a major change. There's what political scientists call realignment, uh, where the ideological composition of the parties begins to change after the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, um, and, in, and also in response to uh, multiple cultural changes, uh, whether it's over abortion or it's over an the anti-war movement or it's over uh, cult issues like the environment versus, uh, versus jobs or uh, the rise of religious fundamentalism. Uh, those all contribute uh, to a growing polarization and a growing movement of conservatives to the Democratic Party, liberals to the uh, to uh, the uh, Democratic Party, and what's left, as they say, you know, in Texas, the only thing in the middle of the road is a yellow line and a dead armadillo. You you go into the middle and you die. And I think that 
what this book argues is you, you can't look just to uh, the rise of, of Gingrichism or to the takeover of the House in 94, which a lot of people do, I think. Uh, you've got to go back into the 1970s. It's there where you see the rise of independent money, for example, as a result of uh, the inadvertent consequences of uh, the campaign finance law in 1974. It's then that you see really the rise of, uh, of the evangelical movement, the rise of grassroots, more extreme grassroots organizations and single-issue organizations, whether that's environmentalism on the one hand or anti-busing or on the other. And then these terrible culturally divisive issues, whether it's flag burning or drug use or sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that really start pushing the country into, into opposing camps. What the changes did was to allow all of that tumult to find its way into the Congress, because the, the, the reforms said, we're going to allow much more activity to take place in the subcommittees. We're going to allow much, many more amendments to be offered on the floor. And in fact, the number of amendments skyrockets from a few hundred per session to over 700, 800, just in a number of years. And so you're now having battles that are fought uh, in the floor of the Congress, battles that are being fought in the committees uh, that didn't used to be fought. You're having coverage of them by the press. And then by the late 70s, you're having live television coverage of them in the, the House floor and shortly after that in the Senate. Uh, and, and as a result, these become, in effect, uh, entertainment and, and, uh, and methods for the parties to get their message out uh, and to uh, demonize the opposition. So it's really the, the push-pull between a more open, transparent, democratic uh, functioning institution and an orderly institution. And the movement here uh, was clearly to open it up to give more people opportunities to offer those amendments, but in so they allowed these more divisive developments to insinuate themselves into the process. Your book also describes at length that the Republican Party for the longest time had a mindset of, we'll, we'll never be a majority, so we might as well just play nice in the sandbox. Um, but there was also a simmering resentment amongst them that the Democrats, in terms of the resources and the control over the operations of the House, had, maybe they had taken a bit more than they should have, and so there was this anger that was boiling there. And John Rhodes, uh, he makes an appearance in your book, an important one, it seems to me. Wh who was he and why is he in your book? So Rhodes is the, is the minority leader of the, the Republican Party in the House uh, from Arizona. Uh, and he, he actually is one of the early proponents of trying to nationalize a political campaign. He sees the advantage of trying to give people an idea of what the Republican Party might stand for uh, in, uh, if it were to be elevated to the majority. But what is happening by the, 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 but he's presiding over a party which is largely starting to divide between uh, sort of the pragmatists, if you will, and I would you know, think of, of uh, uh, I, I would put Rhodes and Bob Michael into that, uh, into that uh, category, and this growing group of people who are coming largely out of the South and out of some border states and some of the suburban communities, the Sun Belt, uh, who are basically arguing, look, uh, if we continue to presume uh, that we can't get to the majority status, that we simply have to be, in effect, accommodationists, um, we're never going to be able to. Uh, if we're just going to, to reach the majority, if we're just going to take the one-third of appropriations, the number of amendments that Democrats give us, we're never going to be able to present ourselves to the public as, a, uh, as an, uh, a, a rational, plausible alternative. And this tension begins to be felt very dramatically uh, in, the, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, you see it, in effect, in the difference between the Ford campaign in 76 and the Reagan campaign, when Reagan challenges Ford. And Reagan, by no means, was considered to be the most conservative of the rising Republicans. In fact, some Republicans in the House are quite disparaging of Reagan. They, they prefer uh, Jesse Helms or John Russolo or some of these people who are far more on, on the right and far more confrontational. Uh, once you get that group uh, electing more younger people. Newt Gingrich is obviously elected in 1978 and becomes 
a, a considerable visionary here of being able to look over the horizon and add the numbers up and say, well, you know, as, as Kevin Phillips had written in 1968, there may in fact be an emerging Republican majority, but we're not going to get there if we don't explain to people how we differentiate from Republicans. So this tension is growing. It's not growing in the late, in the mid 1980s, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. It's growing in the mid 1970s and the late 1970s when there's a reaction to this, uh, to this, this uh, leftward, mo leftward movement of the Democratic Party. Uh, and there are these demographic changes in the South that favor uh, a Republican ascendancy in the region. Henry Hyde was also a major player yes. in this. Was he also a member of the class of 74? He was. In fact, he was the president of the uh, Republican class of 1974. What role did he have in the kind of rising partisanship and the rising power of the Republican Party? Well, Hyde takes over a, a, what had been a failed effort to elevate the issue of abortion. There had been a, an effort in, so you have the Roe v. Wade decision in 73, I think it is, and, uh, and really within the next session of Congress, there are initial efforts uh, to offer some kind of a restrictive amendment in the, in the Congress that, that aren't successful. But in, 70, uh, in 75, late 75, 76, Hyde takes over that, uh, that effort. And I think it's fair to say to almost everyone's surprise, uh, his amendment restricting the use of federal funds uh, in the uh, appropriations bill, uh, barring the use of federal funds for abortion services, uh, passes. And, and of course, in terms of lasting legislation, it's one of the more enduring. It's been in every uh, appropriation bill as a rider uh, since 1976. So he really emerges as a, uh, as a an, uh, maybe the best example of how you can use these rules uh, that the Democrats have so conveniently provided you to offer amendments uh, to in, in a way that, that you can offer an amendment that not only divides, incidentally, Democrats from Republicans, but even divides Democrats. And, and from a tactical, I'm not saying that's why Hyde did it, um, but it had that impact. And uh, that lesson was not lost on other Republicans who looked to other amendments to similarly use those to elevate both their own standing and to, and to exacerbate the differentiation between the two parties. So the development of the House is a more partisan chamber. Um, you got to witness that over four decades. Was there any moment in time where it felt like, for you, this is, this is different? We are really qualitatively changing here. Is there one moment or one vote? Or was it really just kind of a short stepping to a place that was very different from where you began? I think most people would probably point to the uh, ousting of Speaker Wright because it was the most demonstrable case where uh, the speaker had uh, clearly had engaged in certain activities which were uh, transgressions that in the past might have either been overlooked or resulted in a, uh, in a fairly insignificant chastisement by the Ethics Committee or by the House. Um, but because you had uh, in Newt Gingrich and several others, uh, the, the, uh, this very combative, very partisan uh, strategy for bringing down the speaker and relentlessly pursuing uh, this issue, uh, the, the, the atmosphere combined with the kinds of language that were being used, the kinds of accusations were being used that, that previously had been thought of as un unsuited to the to the the chamber and unsuited to uh, politics in general really elevated this el this degree of of uh, the clashing of the two parties I think when it finally got to the point where the speaker was forced to resign um, you know it the 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 issue moved from being I guess an irritation to being something institutional uh, because what it did was to say it's not just a question of the speeches that are made in the special orders or the one-minute speeches or even the uh, floor amendments that are that are forced that are that are so disturbing now you've really structurally 
uh, impeded the operations of, of, of the, the Congress and you've, you've, uh, you've taken it to a completely different level. And at that point, I think everybody dug in their heels and just, uh, you know, and, and just said, you know, there's, there's no going back here. I mean, we're now, I think the other thing that's important though is to put that in the context of the changing times. At that point, by the time you're into the late 1980s, clearly uh, the Republican Party has in its sights the idea that it's going to take down the Democratic majority. It's not just going to take down the Speaker right. And so the, the atmosphere and the, the antagonism on both sides just continues to grow because once, you're, once you have rough parity or you think you have rough parity, you think you have some opportunity to take over the, the majority, your, your inclination for finding compromise diminishes significantly. You don't want to show that the other guys can actually manage the place, uh, and you don't want to be part of the solution. You want to be able to point the finger. Um, so that is sort of roiling there in the late 1980s. I think the, the removal of, of Wright, uh, his resignation, probably is the moment that, that crystallizes it. But again, I think people too often look at the right resignation and say, well, that's when partisanship began, as opposed to saying that's the outgrowth of this of this 10-year uh, emergence of very, very different views of, of, of both public policy issues and a growing competition for control. Often in political conversations, um, there seems to be the assumption that a more partisan Congress is a less productive one. My takeaway from reading your book is that that's not quite accurate, not always at least. Well, you know, partisanship is, it, 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 there's nothing necessarily wrong with people taking strong positions. That's, that's not the question. The question is to what extent you're willing to moderate those positions in, in pursuit of a, some sort of a pragmatic outcome. And uh, there are a number of, of political scientists, Francis Lee of the University of Maryland, uh, foremost among them, who's really looked at this issue of the closing of the gap between the parties as the critical factor where in the past you might have been able to find, even in a partisan environment, there's nothing wrong with partisanship. Uh, as as a congressman in, from New York uh, said at the, be at the beginning of the 20th century, we're all partisans, we're elected by partisans. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not you're willing to step beyond that partisanship and find ways to collaborate. Uh, and I certainly know from my own activity uh, on the Hill, I, I was the staff director on the Resources Committee when Don Young was the chairman from Alaska, one of the most conservative people. And to the extent that he was a conservative, he was hyper-conservative on the issues between before the, before the Resources Committee. And George Miller, one of the most liberal conservation uh, oriented people on the Hill. I was the staff director with John Boehner, very conservative on labor issues, and George Miller, uh, who was one of the most liberal. And yet we found ways to come together and, and pass collaborative legislation. Um, I think because we, that was, the in, that was the experience of more senior legislators, that's what you did. You went beyond, you, you acknowledged where you were, but you went into the room, usually into a back room, and you said, what can you really do here? There was some common goal, we're going to find a way to do this. We're going to find a way to pass this pension bill or this education bill or this public lands bill. You may have had different reasons. Don Young wanted to save more land so he could shoot animals on it. Uh, George Miller wanted to save public land so he could do backpacking on it. Hopefully not the same land. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you're not prepared to think in terms of ultimately the goal here is to get legislation, the goal here is to uh, differentiate yourself from the other parties so you can win the next election, then that objective becomes much more difficult to accomplish. And so there's a difference between being partisan and being hyperpartisan. There's a difference between being competitive and not being collaborative. And I think that's where uh, we go over that edge in, in contemporary politics. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this leads me to uh the issue of is history possibly going to repeat itself? Right now we're in a situation where we have an unpopular Republican president uh, mm -hmm. with limited friends on, on Capitol Hill. We've had for a number of years uh, agitation uh, 
within the House about desire for rules changes. What, by your read, do the re would-be reformers of today want? And do you think that, since we've just had an election and we're going to have an influx of uh, several dozen new members, does that portend for possibilities of rules changes or another change in the operation of the House of Representatives? So there are several groups uh, that are trying to develop some potential rule changes that would uh, provide a, a bridge between the parties and between the partisan interests. Um, I think what's, what's different here than certainly in 1974, for example, uh, is the problem of the partisan divide. Um, so in the 1974, you could have changes, for example, where uh, the minority is given more resources, is given its own staff, is given a greater share of, of uh, the financial resources of the committees. Um, because in some part the minority was not viewed as a credible election opponent in terms of the issue of control. Uh, because the parties themselves, each party had greater ideological diversity. You still had a considerable number of liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. Um, I think what's difficult at this point is that you're locked into this perpetual war, the perpetual campaign for control because the parties are, are still fighting over control and really have been almost ceaselessly since 1994. Uh, and because the parties have become so much more partisan with less middle ground and less diversity within the parties that making rules changes at this point that are designed to accommodate the minority in particular uh, are looked upon as an act of political suicide, not as an act of, uh, of generosity or of collaboration. Uh, so if you give more capacity for um, shaping legislation or directing the uh, operations of the institution, the, the, the operations on the floor, to a group which is sworn to undermine you, then, uh, then uh, you know, your leadership is, is going to get challenged f for that. And I think that's one of the reasons why you see in the 115th, we're just ending the 115th Congress now. I think that every bill that's come to the floor of the 115th Congress has been a closed rule. There are no amendments allowed. So these are bills that in many cases were not even developed by committee. So there's been no chance for, for collaborative uh, development. They are written basically by a combination of the leadership and the uh, leadership of the Republican, but they happen to be the majority. And uh, the Democratic minority say, well, we never even had a chance to have any input in this bill. Now it's coming to the floor. We have no chance to amend it. Um, that's that kind of rigid control that I think a lot of people are looking at and saying, well, it would be better if we opened the system up and you had more of an opportunity. But if you do that and y you still have the, you're doing that in the context of a hyper-partisan environment, uh, what guarantees do you have that any of that, any of that transparency, any of that participatory liberalism that you, you, you allow into the process isn't going to be used for the exact same counterproductive purposes? So, you know, I think some of those reforms are certainly worth talking about. I, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that the Congress would be a better institution if we simply went back to regular order and you had hearings in subcommittees and you had hearings in committees and you proceeded to consider legislation in subcommittee and in full committee. And there still is some, some examples where that happens. They just passed an opioid bill um, that, that uh, was developed largely in, in that manner but very few pieces of legislation are. And I think that exacerbates anger on everyone's part, and that's why you do have both people in the majority and the minority who are looking for ways to, again, as in 1974, open the process up. But it's different in 1974 because now you know that when you open the process up, you are basically just providing, uh, you know, you're putting weapons into the hands of, of, of your political adversaries who have very diminished interest in, in finding collaboration. So I'm pretty cautious about advising just more open rules. I think you have to be, have more open rules and a more, uh, a, a more participatory regular order within certain understandings that we're, gonna, we're trying to find something here that's collaborative. You can't superimpose, you, know, you can't take a, a bill that's developed uh, on a bipartisan basis by people, for example, who are outside the institution and don't have all those 
all those political and daily uh, political considerations and put it into the institution and not assume that the very same energies within the institution are going to tear it apart and, and preclude the kind of collaboration you want. Those efforts, whether they're rules or draft legislation, have to be framed in a way that it becomes safe for people within the institution to consider them and to work on them in a collaborative way. But I don't think you're going to change the institution by throwing, you know, you're not going to change a partisan institution by throwing a, a bipartisan solution at them. The only way you're going to change this, it seems to me, is by showing people within the institution, showing special interests outside the institution, showing the media, which of course exacerbates so much of the, of the partisan divide, uh, that there is some political benefit to collaborating. And then people will want to do it. Politicians want to do things that succeed and that make them look good. Uh, if, if you give them things to do which makes them political targets, which just invites you know, some special interest group or some outside money group in to attack you because you, you voted on a piece of legislation, you voted on a member, well, the members aren't going to want to do that. And of course, that's exactly what happens. Members go to the leadership and they go to the uh, to their committee people and they say, don't bring that bill up or don't, don't allow that amendment to be offered because it's just going to cause me trouble. And as a result, you don't have an open process anymore. I guess also one big difference between today and then is in 74, you had an overwhelming Democratic majority. And so the, the rules changes that were made were made by the caucus. They were the ones who drew up the internal rules changes and bring it up, and Republicans weren't really needed to participate. What it looks like we have here is a much more narrowly divided chamber, and the kind of wild card that's been put out there is whether or not there might be members willing to withhold a, a vote for the speakership for the sake of, you know, forcing a rules change. I mean, any thoughts on that as a strategy? Is that an unprecedented maneuver? Well, you haven't really had a uh, contested speakership in that way since the 1920s. Uh, and uh, it probably came closest with John Boehner in 2013 when he, he came within two votes of, of losing the speakership on the floor. Um, you know, I think that uh, there will be in, in the case of the Democrats who just won the majority, uh, there will be very intense negotiations within the caucus, but my expectation is that leadership decisions will be resolved within the caucus. They will not be resolved uh, on the floor in any kind of, of, of conflict. They will figure out what accommodations need to be made to whatever factions there are so that whoever proceeds as the, as the candidate, and I fully expect it will be Mrs. Pelosi, uh, is is going to receive sufficient votes on the floor. I mean, you don't really want to start off the new session of Congress demonstrating to the world that you're a disorganized caucus that can't even agree on its own leaders. You want to get out of the get out of the gate with a head of steam and, and momentum and, and, and credibility. Uh, so I don't I don't uh, I, I don't really see. Uh, that kind of fight happening in public. But I think it'll probably be a pretty spirited debate uh, within the caucus as to, if not who's going to lead, then how they're going to lead. Uh, what role are newer members going to play? What role uh, are, uh, are people from more marginal districts going to play? Because ultimately, uh, the, the security of those new members is going to be what sustains your majority in the years to come. John, thank you very much for your new book and for talking with me today. And thank you to your viewers. Thank you very much.